Morning, River Hills. How's everyone doing? <laughs> well, it's an exciting morning. Amen? I think we have a picture up here. Um, we have the, the youth are at Lake Geneva Bible Camp. They're headed there anyways. Are they there? They're headed there or they're there? Yeah, they're there. And we're excited for them because the Lord loves to move in camps. Amen? Anyone ever had the Lord moving when they're at a camp or a time away? No? <laughs> I have. It's wonderful. The Lord spoke to me and actually saved me in a family camp. And so we're going to pray from this morning. If you could just stand up with me. As we're praying for them, we're also praying for our own hearts. It's a wonderful truth. The Lord says that he's given us a soft heart, a heart of flesh. So that means everyone in this room has a heart, an ability to receive from the Lord, a special heart given to him. That this morning as we worship, you can receive what God has for us. And I was just thinking, you know, I was reading through Finney's revivals on lecture, and he keeps saying we need the Spirit of God to be poured out. The people need to be excited because when they're excited, then they will move in the power of God. And the first time I ever read that about 15 years ago, I didn't know if, I was like, are we supposed to be excited? I don't, I don't understand. I've never heard that word even used in church. And so I started thinking about the wonders of the Lord, how great he is, how awesome he is. And as I was meditating on that, I was saying, yes, Lord, your people should be excited. Amen? Because they serve an awesome God. Hallelujah. Lord, we lift up the youth of this church this morning, that the Spirit of God will be moving in power this morning upon them. And in their heart of flesh, their soft heart, they would receive all that you have for them. And they would come back excited to serve you, Lord. And their excitement would be deeply contagious and would spread throughout the church, Lord. Lord, we come to you in humility this morning, saying again and again, we need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need our hearts to be revived and excited. Lord, that you come in times of great kindness and love and you pour out yourself upon us. As we seek you this morning, we say, yes, this is the day of salvation. Today, right now, as we seek you, our hearts are ready to receive in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. I would encourage you to just keep praying for the kids throughout the week. Uh, this camp that they're going to, um, my mom started bringing me when I was five. I went 31 years in a row in some capacity. I was uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit there. I was miraculously healed there. So was my brother. I, I laid hands on people for the first time and had watched them get healed, watched them get baptized in the Holy Spirit. But while David was praying, one of them, an incredible memory is one day, I mean, I think 35 years later after my mom started bringing me to that camp, she sat me down and she opened an old letter and it was from her aunt who was from North Dakota, and she had made a trip to this, these tabernacle meetings in Alexandria, and she was baptized in the Holy Spirit for the first time, and it was at that camp in 1937. So, and it has an incredible heritage of thousands upon thousands of people praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon these kids. So join with me in praying for them this week, but hey, let's let the outpouring just start right now, amen? Let's worship together. Stand with us if you want to come to the altar. Um, however God leads you, just pour out your heart before God.
thou has ended in the kingdom of light in the kingdom of
thank you for the power of your presence this morning, God.
He's worthy of all our praise. He's worthy of all our praise. He's worthy of all our praise. against every darkness, every principality. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. He's the overcomer. He's the deliverer this morning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so good. When darkness tries to roll away,
Praise you, Jesus. You may be seated. Uh, those who are serving communion today, whether you know it or not, please come forward. Praise you, Jesus. Oh. You know, what we celebrate today as we do this is the power that we have access to now freely all of the time because of what Jesus did. We invite you to partake with us. Um, you don't have to be a member of the church. You just have to know Jesus is your Savior. So, God, I just thank you. And, Lord, we give a moment of time for those at home to find whatever they can use for elements, God, to represent your broken body and your shed blood. But Lord, we just remember you in this time. Lord, we remember you in respect and adoration. We remember you, God. Lord, just for what you endured, what you persevered, what you took on for us. But we also remember you because, God, you released us into the other side of the cross. Lord, to walk not only through the fellowship of your suffering, but into the power of your resurrection. And Lord, I pray as we, Lord, we remember you by taking these elements, you just release your power. And all those who are sick, may they be healed. Lord, by your shed blood and by your broken body, God, by your stripes, they will be healed. Lord, touch everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. you God. Lord, we just thank you for your body, which is broken for us. And 
all that it represents. And God, I pray that we would just step into that, embrace it, experience it, God. Lord, if we're sick, to call upon your name. Oh, if there are sick among us, that we call upon your name. Lord, for those who are distraught in despair, God, who have wallowed and waited and, and maybe made some wrong turns in this season of confusion, Lord, we lift them up and, and Lord, we call upon your name. Lord, knowing that you have provided healing from, Lord, from that day forward for every sickness, every disease, you took it upon your body. And we do this in remembrance of you, God. Let's partake of the bread together. Hmm. Hmm. Praise you, God. Lord, as we prepare to to take this cup in remembrance of you. Lord, you ask us to do it every time that we, we got together because you are the new covenant. <laughs> it is your blood that was shed for us once and for all. Lord, as we do, we just pray that you would wash. Lord, wash over every one of those young people who are going to camp this week, God. Lord, release them into their God-given identity as beloved sons and daughters of God. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you continue to wash them all week long so they come home with a new identity that can never be taken away, adopted. And Lord, we thank you for the same adoption made possible by this blood in Jesus' name. Let's partake together. Please stand with us for one more worship song.
turn morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory Cause you're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn Give up everything else for one more moment oh, of your presence. Oh, There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Thank you, Lord. We just agree on that, Lord. There is nothing better than you, and that is a declaration. Amen. So let's transition now into these declarations and stand and recite these with me, please. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives in me, and he speaks through me, and I am a reflection of his goodness and his glory. Because he lives in me, I have supernatural power to witness and release miracles, signs, and wonders. We are united with Christ by his spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you enjoyed worship? I guess I did too. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, God. Hallelujah. Well, you have an opportunity to continue in worship right now in giving. Um, if you are going to give personally, there is a uh, offering plate in the back of the church that you can place your offering in on the way out. If not, there's a couple different options, the website or the app. Um, I just want to give God so much thanks and glory for the last 20 months of all that has been done in here and around here. Um, I want to say we've done all that we can for now, you know, but it's, I remember when Terry McCarty was on the board and he goes, we need a top 10 list, you know, and it's like, okay, so we started a list, the, um, you know, deferred maintenance, the things that needed to be done, uh, and, and we tried to keep that top 10 current and it was amazing because it didn't matter how many came off you know there always was more to put on but right now I'm, I'm feeling a little reprieve we have a brand new roof um, and, uh, uh, Friday I believe it was um, the gutters were finished and it was funny because the, the guy came to me he's from Moldova so I was talking to him about God and he brought his 10 year old son back on Friday and I was, and it, but Thursday night before he left, he looked and he goes, you know, it's negotiating to redo the downspout in the back so we didn't have flooding in the elevator shaft. And, you know, it, it, we got a front and he goes, why doesn't the gutter go all the way across the front? <laughs> I said, because it never has. <laughs> like, well, it should. I mean, I, I agree. 
So now the gutter goes all the way across the front. Um, but it was just, it feels so good. Um, I, I was getting done with the lift Monday, and I was just like, huh, I'm so glad I'm done with this thing. And the head of the, the you know, overseer the, of the roofing company came in, and he was looking around, and he goes, is that some mold that came back in the ceiling? And I was like, oh, geez. I'm not done with the lift yet. <laughs> so by about 9 o'clock Monday night, I was done with the lift. And uh, I just am so happy to be done. You know, you ever felt that way about different projects? But this has been, you know, finish painting the sanctuary big wall and hang different speakers and finish the roof and the ceiling. And um, it's all by the provision of God, but it comes through you. And so I just ask you, you know, as God blesses you, just to remember to continue to bless the kingdom of God and the church. As we go forward, um, there is still a, the saturate, and um, you can be a part of that. We also have 9,000 new little flyers um, because there is an event going to be at the state capitol on September 4th called Merge. And one of the things that's happened with um, ever since the George Floyd incident and everything that has, has come out of it, you know, initially it looked like just ugly, the Twin Cities was this epicenter of all that is bad with the country, you know? And, and people were just shocked. It's like, we never thought it'd be the Twin Cities. Well, what's happened is that it's gotten the attention of people around the world, and it's like every three weeks to a month, there's another ministry event taking place in the Twin Cities. And it's a great example of what the enemy might have meant for evil that God is turning around for good. And Merge is one of these. It's a, a nationwide group, and they're going to have at the state capitol on the 4th um, the representation of the 100 different nationalities or people groups that represent the Twin Cities. And there'll be food carts from all over the world, and there'll be tents representing all these different cultures with the, you know, the main purpose of coming together in praise and worship and uniting all peoples together under Christ. So please be praying with us. The, the flyers are for that event. Um, the next weekend, the, the parade is on. And if you don't remember, we, we just kind of took a hiatus a few years ago from having a float in the parade to serving floats at the parade. And it was a big hit. So we'll be doing that again outside the Tobias's, you know backyard, which happens to be right on the parade route. And um, so there's many opportunities for you to be involved in hands-on ministry to the community, both here in Invergrove Heights and also at the state capitol. So please put that on your calendar. And it's just exciting to see what I feel is a momentum that is happening with God's love for the Twin Cities. And it's just becoming overwhelming. It's like waves of his love as people come from all over. So God, we just thank you. Lord, that every penny, every dollar, everything that we give, God, goes to multiplying the kingdom of God. Lord, this is a barn, but it's meant to be filled with the wheat of the harvest. And so, God, what is represented in Saturate, what's represented in the Merge event, what's represented in, in serving at our community parade and events, uh, in prayer tents, Lord, is to bring in the harvest. And so, God, we pray that you would use each dollar and multiply it for your harvest. Lord, just like every seed that is planted in the field, Lord, can produce 30-fold, 60-fold, sometimes even 100-fold in bushel. We pray the same for every gift that is given. And Lord, bless each giver in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's what's happening at Inver Hills Church. Brian Fenmore's classes are continuing this month with School of Destiny on Thursday, August 12th at 7 p.m. and Prophetic Training on August 15th at 5.30 p.m. Every month we are seeing new faces join us as people are eager to learn more about all that God has for them. Brian is a dynamic teacher and provides insight for living a remarkable spirit-led life. Also on Sunday, for five-year-olds to fifth graders, we provide Club Fearless where kids learn how to hear God's voice and become a fearless follower of Jesus. For the ladies, meet us at the church for movie night on August 13th at 6.30. We're showing Mom's Night Out, a movie with lots of laughs. 
We'll provide popcorn and drinks. You bring a friend and a favorite movie snack. Sign up now at the welcome board or at ihchurch.com. And for the men, we hope you're hungry. Men's breakfast is Saturday, August 14th. Meet here at the church at 9 a.m. Then on Wednesday, the 18th, it's the summer's last barbecue at the home of Dimitri and Aya. Chef Dima has a special meal plan, so bring your own drink and plan on a great evening together. Please sign up for the events either in the church lobby or online at ihchurch.com. www.celebratingthenations.com Take your Bibles or your, your PDAs and turn to Book of Acts chapter 1. And I'm just going to read the first eight verses as we continue in the Holy Spirit series. <sighs> what a great video that Merge put together. Um, as you're turning there, it reminded me in 1988, I went along as a youth sponsor to Washington, D.C., and uh, there were 50,000 uh, Christian youth at the mall worshiping together. And there was just this sense of reclaiming the nation for God. And, um, you know, since 1988, I think, you know, several times we've had to focus on reclaiming the nation for God, its capital and ours. And this is another part of that, in bringing the unity of the nations together under Christ. So... Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. In my first book, I told you, um, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and to teach. Until the day he was taken up to heaven and after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days that he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift that he promises, as I told you before. John the Baptist, or John baptized you in water, but in just a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles went to Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, what is the time come for you to free Israel and to restore our kingdom? And he replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. <laughs> I want you to repeat with me. They are not for you to know. Say that again. They are not for you to know. But, and, and I do that because we can get so distracted by the signs of the times that we forget that we really need to focus on is being filled with the Holy Spirit all of the time. So that is not for you to know, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Gia and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus, I just pray that you would just, <laughs> through your spirit, refocus us onto our main purpose on this earth, 
and God, it is to tell people about Jesus. It's to demonstrate Jesus. It's to be carriers, God, of the true antivirus, of the true cure, of the true remedy, Lord, not only to sickness, but to social justice issues, sickness in our society, sickness in people's hearts. And that one true antivirus has a name, and it is Jesus. And Lord, we are to carry it. Lord, it is in us. Lord, when we accept Jesus, God, we've got it in us. <laughs> Lord, there is an immunity that comes from you. Lord, that is supposed to come through us to all that needs it. And Lord, it happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to understand that more and further and deeper. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some of you saw this in a devotion to, uh, this week, and I just want to read it to you. It was an interesting um, illustration, and if I've done it before, forgive me, but it says, a rattlesnake bit one of my sheep in the face about a week ago. How many read this or heard it? A couple of you. The deadliest snake that lived around here, the sheep's face swelled up and it hurt, it hurt her terribly. But the old rattlesnake didn't know the kind of blood that flows through the sheep. Anti-venom is most often made from sheep's blood. The sheep swelling was uh, swelled for about two days, but the blood of the lamb destroyed the venom of the serpent. And as soon as I read that line, I'm like, oh, oh, I know what this is. This is a testimony of Jesus right here. <laughs> it was like, come on, you don't put it in those words. It says, I was worried, but the sheep didn't care. She kept on eating kept on drinking and kept on climbing because she knew she was all right. Often the serpents of this life will reach out and bite us. They inject their poison into us, but they cannot overcome the blood of the Lamb of God that washes away the sins of the world and the sting of death. Don't worry about the serpent or his bite. Just make sure that the Lamb's blood is flowing through your veins. And I love words of encouragement like that. Because I think it's a great illustration of what happens to us sometimes when we think that we're going down the right path and we're so, you know, for, for many years as this pastor, it's it just, a it pastor this year, it seemed like any time that I said publicly to any group of people that I was so thankful for this church and how good this church was, a snake would show up and there would be a huge snake bite. And it would be like, I am never going to say this is a good church again. You know, it'd be like, oh, that was so painful. You know, and most of the time, the snake bites in the body of Christ come from within. So what? So what? You have the blood of the lamb running through your veins, and in it, okay, is the cure for any bite. So it doesn't matter how the enemy sneaks in. In fact, I believe with all my heart, with every bite, if you follow Christ, you get stronger. You become more immune. And that is the power of the shed blood of Jesus that runs through your veins. But how is he at work in you? The Holy Spirit is not a gift of power, but of God himself, John G. Lake wrote. And one of the things that we share in common with a now retired pastor of Destiny Church, Rochester, um, is the fact that I believe, just as he does, that the gift, the gift of the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit. But John G. Lake goes a little farther in reminding us what the main thing is. Because, you know, it's, it's very easy in Christianity and in life in general to get steered away from the main thing and get focused on a minor thing, and pretty soon you're arguing over the minor thing and you have division, and everybody forgets the main thing. So the main thing about the fact of what was poured out in the first church and which is poured out today, the Holy Spirit is, the gift is the Holy Spirit, but also that the gift is God because the Holy Spirit is God. And I, I don't know why, but it seems like he, out of the three that are a part of the triune nature of God, in the beginning, uh, in, the book of, in, in the book of Genesis, it talks about he created us in, in their image. And there's a lot of language that teaches us that they, okay, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were there in the beginning. They have been together, all right? 
So we know, I think we embrace the fact that Jesus was there in the beginning, John 1.1. 1, 1, For in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then he says, and then the Word came to earth and became flesh and walked among men. So we're like, yeah, it's the Word. He spoke the Word, and all the worlds came into order. So Jesus and God were there. But sometimes I think we forget that the Holy Spirit, all right, is God as well. So when you have the Spirit in you, you have God in you. Now, wait a minute. God sits on the throne. For he who sits on the throne and unto the land. I mean, it's like, how can, you know what? Here's, I think, why we struggle so much with understanding that God, through the Holy Spirit, is in us. Because it's not something that our finite mind can even wrap its thoughts around, okay? The God of the universe dwelling in us. But you can't appreciate and know the nature of God without understanding that if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have God in you. So what? I said, I believe that God, by the Spirit, has baptized many in the Holy Spirit. John G. Lake goes on to say, hundreds of hundreds of people have been baptized in the Holy Spirit just in the last few months. And he writes this back then, but it's even, it's even more true today. Um, I think Leith Hetland is now at over 2.2 million converts in, uh, <laughs> in Muslim-closed countries. His largest group of converts is in Pakistan. I um, was just talking to a, a missionary from Pakistan, and um, there's a couple in this church that support another missionary in Pakistan. And there, it's, God has no borders, all right? You know, when I was a little kid, which was before a lot of you were born, um, there, they came out with Christian comics. I wasn't allowed to have a secular, you know, comic. Those were, I couldn't, uh, couldn't come in the house. But I remember one of the first Christian comics my mom gave me was God Smuggler. And remember that? Back in the day where it was huge because... Um, Operation Andrew, I mean, these guys would fill suitcases of Bibles and take them across the communist borders into the countries so that people could have Bibles. And that was punishable by death or by imprisonment. But time after time in this comic book that I would read at seven and eight years old, they would open up these suitcases in customs and look right at the Bibles and it's like not see them and pass them through. Well, that's because God, there's no boundaries for God. All right? And just because, think of it now. I mean, one of the, uh, the you know, more well-known prophets of, uh, of the United States uh, over the last several hundred years, um, Bob Jones, almost, I think it's 35 years ago now, is, um, went to a young pastor who felt sent to Kansas City but didn't know exactly why, and he said, he had an opportunity, he was going to be given some land to start his ministry, and he wasn't sure about it. And um, the way I understand the story, Bob Jones looked at him and he says, you know, you're supposed to take this land, you're supposed to start your ministry here. And he said, someday, he said, there will be women in the rice paddies in China watching worship from your church on their television. That was like 40 years ago. And the pastor is looking at this prophet like, <laughs> thank you yeah nice word he's walking away and going that is crazy and I remember being with Dave at one thing when that pastor was talking about how they were streaming worship 24-7 all over the world and that in the rice paddies in China the women were watching the live worship on their televisions see God God had a plan. He has a plan. He is the plan. He always will be the plan. We just have to believe enough in the plan to let the plan work through us. And if he tells you to do something, you don't have to see the end. You don't have to even believe in the end. You just have to believe in the plan who is God. And a part of God's plan was that Jesus come and that he give his life to bridge the gap between man and God again to pay the price for our sin so that God could enter us through his spirit, the very promise of God, so he could work his plan through us. And his plan is that the enemy who he sent to this earth 
would be defeated by the power of God through his children, which are you. So you are not a bystander in his plan. You are not in the bleachers. Now, how many know that there was a, a Minnesota professional sports team that won last night? Well, my brother-in-law and my nephews and niece, they were there. And it's one of the few things I could actually watch now that I don't have the internet and I just have a little antenna. And uh, Minnesota United. Woo! Oh, they won. And in the, in the stadium was packed. You missed it. And it was funny because it was such a good game. They didn't just win. They, they, they kept the momentum and they kept the ball on their offensive side, I mean, almost the entire time I watched, I didn't watch the whole game, but it caught my attention because I, I got home at whatever it was last night, and um, I was flipping through the channels, and it comes on, and I knew that my family was going to be there. But if, if you've ever watched soccer games, I mean, they have some of the most fanatic fans in the world. In fact, they've had to shut, I mean, they've burned down stadiums. They've had riots in Europe. Well, I'm, I turn it on, and here in... St. Paul, Minnesota, it sounds like Europe. The fans are chanting. When they get done and they win, there's, there's some song they sing. And they pan the audience and they all have their, you know, scarves and all the paraphernalia that I guess you get when you're a soccer fan or f football. Um, <laughs> it's great to have a football team in Minnesota that's winning. Uh, anyway, but I was looking at the energy and I was like, the last game I saw wasn't too far back, and it was like the first time in seven or eight times of facing Seattle that they beat them. And, and it, it created momentum. It was like they had been bit by that snake six times in a row, and this time they weren't going to be defeated. And the energy that was coming from that stadium, you could see the, you know, how excited the fans were, but it was also igniting the players. Well, in the kingdom of God, none of you are sitting in the bleachers. You're on the field. You're in the game. You are the army that God has selected to win the battle. So anybody believing that they're not in the battle is believing a lie and helping the other side. Now, soccer, like most other team sports, relies on everyone doing their job. You know, I've told this story before, but David was in hockey. David, you know, suffers a little bit from the same thing his dad does, a little ADD. Hey, look, a rabbit. And I was, I just, I knew if he was going to stay in hockey that one of us was going to have to quit our weekend job. Because once you get to Bantams, they're, they're gone every weekend except one weekend of the year. So I'm like, okay, I got to find out if he's really into this. So I put him in spring league, which was at 6 a.m. in the morning, three to five mornings a week. And I'm like, hey, if he gets through spring league and he still wants to be in hockey, we'll let him be in hockey. Well, I was at a game, you know, at one of those morning games, and it was David's turn to be in the goal. And it's a team sport. And they had a good team, and so the puck was normally at the other end most of the time, and I was watching it, and I wasn't keeping my eye on David, and all of a sudden there's a breakaway, and it's heading to the goal, and I look, and David was turned around, and he was looking up in the balcony behind him. <laughs> so I did, I was like, Whoosh. well, you don't whistle at a hockey game. Because the refs have whistles. So everyone on the ice stopped. And I was just like, ah, who did that? So, so the official comes over to the bench and he's looking at the coaches and he's like, if the coaches did it, it's a penalty. And all the coaches just turned around and pointed. And I was just like, wanted to, you want to get away? You know, it's like a Southwestern Airline commercial. But my point was, it's like, David, David he's, he's, he, he's going to, oh no, he's going to let the team down, you know? So I want to get his attention. And there are so many times, I believe, that believers, because they don't understand their true identity, and that they have the power of the kingdom of God in them, that they're in the game, but they're not paying attention, 
or they feel powerless, whatever it is, it's partnering with a lie because you have all the power of the kingdom of God in you, on you, and through you by the Holy Spirit. Now, John G. Lake, I've really been uh, just... I don't know, God has just drawn me to him. Now, if you don't know who he is, he, he started in Spokane, Washington, and he started the healing rooms. I mean, it, it, the healing rooms have had a resurgence over the last probably 25 years. Um, started again in Spokane, spread across America and now across the world. But God started using him in healing so much that he went to South Africa, he went to Australia, and everywhere he went, I mean, people started, I mean, they just kept getting healed and the healing rooms just, he trained people in how to have healing rooms. But he, he has a progression here that I think is so important. And he, he goes on to say, Jesus went to heaven in order that the very treasury of the heart of the eternal God might be unlocked for your benefit and that out of the very soul of the eternal God, the streams of his life and nature would possess you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. And that uh, there would be just as much of the eternal God in your toenails and in your brain um, <laughs> that each of you are able to contain. In other words, from the very soles of your feet to the last hair on the top of your head, every cell of your being would be a resident of the spirit of the living God. Man is made alive by God and with God and by his spirit. And in the truest sense, man is the dwelling place of God, the house of God, the tabernacle of the Most High. Now, we've spent three to four different weeks going to Scripture that says you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. How many believe you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? Because I don't want to start singing again, you know? No, ye not. No, ye not. You are the temple. You are the temple of God. So the next time that you feel snake bitten, you feel attacked, you feel discouraged, you need to let the enemy know, I am the temple of the holy living God. You need to let yourself know you're the temple of the living God. Now, what he goes on to say is so important. So he says, listen, the words that I speak, I speak not of myself, but of the Father that dwelleth in me, John 14, 10. But the Father that dwelleth in me, where did the eternal Father dwell in Jesus Christ? Why? Hmm. Why in every part of his being, within and without, in the spirit of him, in the soul of him, in the brain of him, in the body of him, in the blood of him, in the bone of Jesus, every single solitary cell of his structure was the dwelling place of the God of gods. Do you remember David Wilkerson, his humble beginnings, I'm pretty sure, uh, I mean, I, I know the history, but some of the, you know, some of the details escape me. But goes to Bible college, um, pretty sure I know which one, but it's immaterial. They, he, he finds his wife there. They get married. They have, you know, your typical, you know, wedding gifts, and they pack it all up, and they go to, and I'm almost positive it was Detroit, and they had an apartment, and they put everything in it, and they went to church, and they came back, and everything was stolen. And... Um, it reminds me, the year before I was going to go to North Central, I drove down 3.30 in the morning. It's raining cats and dogs. I go to my brother's apartment on 15th Avenue. I go inside three minutes later. The rain subsides. I go out to my car, and everything, everything that mattered to me was stolen. And I remember getting up on the top of my car, standing on the roof and just screaming, Why didn't you just take the car? And I was just like, Really? Well, they had everything stolen that night. And they came home, and it was like, all their gifts. And it's almost like, do we still send thank you cards? You know, it's like, well, I guess we have to. Do we tell them we better not? But in it, God spoke to him and put New York on his heart, and he went there, knowing nothing about the inner cities, just feeling called there. He goes to New York, and, you know, the whole story goes, he meets Nikki Cruz, the leader of the Mau Mau's, one of the worst gangs, and he pulls a knife on him. But what I'm getting at is, he said, I'm going to cut you up, preacher, and what did, what did David Wilkerson say? He said, you could cut me into a thousand pieces and everyone would say, I love you. Now, until I was working on this message, I mean, that was, that was like, you know, it, I, obviously it never escaped me when I read that in the book starting at, I believe, seven or eight years old. I mean, 
But it just hit me. If you truly believe, like John G. Lake is saying, that with Jesus, he had God in him, that meant that God was in every cell of his body, well, then you have to believe that when you have the Holy Spirit in you, that God is in every cell of your body. And because Dave Wilkerson understood that, he said, it doesn't matter how many pieces you cut me up in, every one of them is still going to have God in it. Now, if that's what you believe in, that's what you walk in any day and every day, there's no snake that can bite you that's going to overcome you. Because every cell in your body has the anti-venom already in it. Are you following me? When you look for God, you do not look on the surface. You look within. When you discern a man to see whether God is in him, you look into the spirit of him, into the soul of him, into the depth of him, and there you see God. How trifling are the con controversies that surround the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Men are debating such trifle issues. For instance, does a man speak in tongues or does he not? Uh, do not think for a moment that I am discounting the value of tongues. And see, this is really safe for me because I can address this subject reading somebody else's words. You know? But he's a powerful man of God. But here he is, years ago, talking about the very issues that we still address today in the church. He says, But, beloved, I will tell you what my heart is straining for. Down there at Jerusalem, they not only spoke in tongues, but they spoke in the language of the nations. Oh, I, this is so burning on my heart because merge is coming. And it's, you know, it's not like Jesus is coming, but it's another event coming to the Twin Cities to help the church understand that God came and sent us to what? To the nations. Well, God has sent a hundred nations represented in the Twin Cities. So you don't have to go on a plane, which is very difficult right now, and go overseas because there's a hundred nations represented right here. And you're supposed to go what? To all the, make disciples of every nation. Well, there's a hundred here to start with. They're your neighbors. And you have God in every soul in your body, and they need it. They need that antivirus. So he will in whatever language he desires, speak through you if he will allow him to. And if our present experience in tongues is not satisfying, um, God bless you, go on into languages. Go learn some other languages. Let God speak through you. As God meant to in the very first place. Dear ones, I feel the need of that. And I feel it weighed down in my heart in the depths of the hurts. I live in South Africa. This is, he's writing from his time in South Africa. And I lived there for a number of years where it is commonly said that there are 100,000 tribes of native people. Every last one of the 100,000 speak a different dialect. These tribes number sometimes as low as 10,000 people and sometimes as high as hundreds of thousands, even millions of people. Supposing we were going to undertake the evangelizing of Africa... Rapidly, it would be necessary for a hundred thousand different missionaries and have them all at one time master one particular language, for there are a hundred thousand of them. No, sir, I believe before high heaven that when the spirit of the eternal God is poured out upon all flesh, that out of the real Christian body will arise a hundred thousand men and women in Africa that will speak in the language of every separate tribe by the power of God. Now, this concept is called glossolalia, and it is what happened on the day of Pentecost. That is why those Galileans, who mostly were uneducated men, came out of the upper room, and they were speaking the languages of, the, the, of every culture that happened to be in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover in the, in the day of Pentecost, because it was law for Jewish people to come from all nations to be there. So there is a list in the book of Acts chapter 2. If you don't believe me, it is a long list. And they were speaking all those languages. Not in their own power, but in God. And, you know, I can't, for the sake of time, tell you the number of stories where I've been in a, in a service, especially as a boy when I was 
wrestling with God about that and says, God, does that really still happen today? And somebody starts speaking in tongues and it sounds like an oriental language and somebody who is visiting, who is from China, goes over to them weeping and gives them a great hug and you find out that they spoke perfect Mandarin to them and they told them about the love of God and the hope of God for them. And these were uneducated Norwegians from northern Minnesota. I've seen it happen. It happens. It's, why does it happen? Because if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have God in you, and nada es difícil para Dios. Nothing is difficult for you. All right? So when we go to a school, we see classes arranged for every grade. I was talking to a young school teacher who teaches the country a little public school, and I said, how many have you in your school? And she said, eight grades. Fifteen scholars divided into eight grades. The Christian church is God's big school. What student in the eighth grade would think of saying to a child learning the ABCs, you haven't anything, why don't you have the eighth grade understanding? Well, in due time, you will have it. That is the reason the student does not say it. It is because he knows the child will have it. One day that boy will understand just the same as the older child does. A weak Christianity always wants to drop the imperfect and adjust itself to the popular mind. But a real Christianity um, ever seeks to be made perfect in God, both in character and gifts. What is he saying here? He goes, we are in school every day. The cool thing is we have the master teach in our class. And he's not just teaching it from the outside. You, can't, you don't just Zoom him. He is in you. And if you open the word of God in you and upon you, he translates it to you through his spirit. And so you, if there's, how many there are things about God that you don't know and understand? Raise your hand. That's why you're in school every single day. And you have the greatest tutor, you have the greatest teacher, and he's in you. And Jesus came so that he could be released to you, and he is the very spirit of God, and he's in every cell of your body. Now, I don't have time to, to finish the rest of these pages. But what's on these pages, and what I believe where God is going with this, is if God is in you and he's in all of you, that means that those of you who struggle with your emotions, it's because you are not walking in the reality that God is in your emotions. And whatever emotions you're struggling with can come under the authority of God because the authority of God is in you. For those of you who are struggling with your willpower, chocolate, your willpower, sugar, your, whatever it is, God is in your willpower. He's infused into your DNA. And if you don't believe it, you're partnering with a lie because you remember any area of your life where you struggle with hopelessness is an area where you've partnered with a lie. The truth is, God is in every part of you. If you struggle with your thought life, it's because you're believing a lie that God is not in your thought life. And once you step into the reality that God is in your thought life, you won't have a problem staying away from impure thoughts because you don't want to have those kind of thoughts in front of the presence of God, which is there. Do you realize that you have to partner with a lie to even have impure thoughts? It's the same lie that Satan was giving to Adam and Eve in the garden. It's the same kind of lie. But he's in there. So there is a battle. And, and we, we are just like the first century church in, in some instances. You know, we, America is very, you know, Anglo-Saxon, Greco-Roman. It's, it's very much of that thinking. And we, we, sometimes we try to operate in our mind instead of out of our spirit. But guess what? God is in the mind too. 
He's in the mind too. What are you supposed to do with every thought? Take him captive under the obedience of Christ. All right, he's there. And that's why I, I, wanna, I just want to wrap up with this one illustration. And I don't want to shut this. This is such good material. I'm, but this is what I, God just put on me when we were in rally. And, and that I believed a lie about myself from the very first day I was baptized in the Holy Spirit until probably, I don't know, six, eight years ago. And I would speak it as if it was the truth all the time. I was very nonchalant about it. And what I would say is, you know, I knew what the fruits of the Spirit was, but I would say, you know, I've got the Holy Spirit in me, but I certainly don't have gentleness. I'm not gentle. You know, and, and I, I, it's like, well, I'm not, you know. And I was so convicted by the Holy Spirit one night when I was praying in here because he just kind of <laughs> had a little dialogue with me as my teacher, okay? The teacher pulled me aside and said, do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Absolutely, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. And what is the Holy Spirit? Well, he's love, he's joy, he's peace, he's patience, he's kindness, he's goodness, he's... And I get to gentleness, and he says, say that again? No, I go, gentle, gentleness. He goes, so you have the Holy Spirit in you, so you have gentleness in you. Well, yeah. So you are gentle. No. He's like, let's go through that again. You know, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's in you. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is gentleness, so you are gentle. I didn't feel gentle. I didn't. In fact, the fact that God was making me go back to the same answer on the test that I had gotten wrong for probably 25 years made me less gentle because I don't like getting things wrong. But he says, you, you are gentle. And, I'm, you know, I'm looking at the test, and I'd written, I'm not gentle. <laughs> and God said, change that because it's not true. And I just got to tell you, in that moment with my teacher who is living in me and is on me and speaks through me, not only in my spirit but in my mind, in my emotions and in my will, I just did a little mental exercise and I erased that and I put, I am gentle, and I became gentle. And I want to tell you that it was a lifelong process. It wasn't. You see, when I accepted the Holy Spirit, gentleness was in me. I just believed in a lie that I wasn't gentle. Now, I was speaking with somebody the other day, and I, I said this in, 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 in rally, and this is, uh, somebody walked up to somebody's husband and said, your wife is so sweet. And the husband just laughed. <laughs> you don't know my wife. First of all, swing and a miss, strike one. Don't say that, guys. Just, you know, just don't. Just grab a Twix or a Snickers bar and shove it in your mouth. Don't say that. But it was okay, kind of, because the wife said to me, well, it's true, I'm not sweet. And immediately God reminded me of my lie that I had partnered with my whole life that I wasn't gentle. And I said to this young lady, I said, do you remember the song... There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, where is this place? Where does the spirit of the Lord reside? Uh, in me. And I go, so that means that you are sweet. No, uh, yeah, yes, it does. And I reminded them of my journey. And I said, you need to sit down with the direction and the correction of the Holy Spirit and erase that, I am not sweet, and just replace it with, I am sweet. Well, that sounds too simple. That is what's so incredible about the power of the Holy Spirit in you. It is that simple. Because it is God in you, and nothing is impossible for God. And so much of what has you bound, so much of what has messed up your identity, so much, uh, everything that has made you stuck is you partnered with a lie. And when you partner with a lie, it's like chaining yourself to a post. You so want to go on with God, but you're so stuck. 
And when you partner with God who is in you, and he reveals your true identity, he breaks the chain. He breaks the chain. And I, it brings me back to the, the young man at the altar when Michael French said to him, now every time, I, I've been saved many times, but every time I walk away, Satan says, you're not saved. It's a lie. And he says, every time Satan says that to you, say, you're a liar. And if you were here, I mean, every three or four step, that, that guy said, you're a liar. You're a liar. <laughs> and I'm standing up there going, Wow. That's how much the enemy is trying to keep him bound. He speaks to him that often. Some of you don't even realize that's what's happening in your mind all of the time. But once you let God, the teacher within you, reveal who you really are, and you embrace the truth, and you hear that voice, it's like, no, I am gentle. You're a liar. <laughs> You're the father of lies. In me is the father of light. Stand up with me this morning. I, I am driving the bus, and I am so trying to get to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But each Sunday, I want to get there. There's another thing that he has to reveal, but I know it's because this stuff has to be dealt with for us to truly step into the anointing that he has for us. You can't be completely baptized walking in the full power that God intends for you if you're partnering with a lie. But the truth is, God is in your emotions. He is there. In that center, he is not outside of it. He is there. Everything you need, okay, to walk in peace, to overcome whatever emotion controls you is already there. Your thoughts... He's parked right there. Your will, he's there. Your body, mm -mm. he's in every cell. I thank God for medicine. But I also thank God that in my DNA and my RNA, <laughs> I have God. And I can call upon his name. He can change my receptors. He can change anything in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, because his son died to release that power in and through us. So whatever it is this morning, it, it, God is speaking to you. And I, I tell you, this altar is for you to be set free. It's, it's something you do as a public demonstration that you want God. And if you do that publicly, it empowers you privately to overcome the battle that you're having. But if in front of your brothers and sisters in Christ, you can't step forward and say, God, I need help, you're really going to have a difficult time in the privacy of your own home doing it. And so if God's speaking to you, this altar is for you. I spent an entire lifetime so far coming to more altar calls than I, I dare say, you know? And even if it wasn't a topic that dealt with me, if the Holy Spirit convicted me to move, I moved. What it did is empower me over the enemy. Because if I would move in the Spirit when he asked me, I know I can call on him in any situation, and I can move in the Spirit. So whether it's your thought life, whether it's, you know, your emotions, um, even your willpower, if you're struggling and, and you are struggling even right now believing the truth that God is in there with you, whatever the lie is, and it needs to be broken off, I want you to come. And ministry team, I want you to come up here. It's as simple as confessing and believing. You confess with your mouth all right? That God is there, that, that whatever that lie is, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I can't ever. There is no can't ever with God. You know? <laughs> I, I still, Enoch walked with God and was no more. It's like, 
whenever I, I think of something impossible in my life, God brings me that. Enoch walked with God and he was no more. It's like God says, end of story. Hey, enemy, end of story. So if that's you today, and you know, I, I've prayed with the intercessors about this. The last, like I said, three times I've preached, people have come to me during the week and said, man, I really felt like I should have go up, but I, I just can't go up. We're going to, in a moment, shut the camera off. But God doesn't shut his off. So come, if that's you. God, I thank you that we have you in us. Oh, we can't comprehend it, which is fine. You are so beyond our gray matter, our mind, and yet you're in every cell. God, I've watched people go under the knife and have sections of their brain removed and have the doctors say to me and their family, they, may, they will never speak again and they won't remember you. And as I sat in a chair out in the middle of the ICU unit and they opened their eyes for the first time, they looked over at their husband and said, Chris, what are you doing? What's Pastor Bart doing out there? Get another chair and let him sit here. <laughs> It's like, well, wait a minute. They weren't supposed to have a memory and they weren't ever supposed to speak again. And yeah, it's the miracle of the mind, but who designed that thing? Who dwells in that thing? God does. So whatever it is, some of you have had strokes and you're like, ah, oh, I am limited. You're not limited. Until you leave this earth, you're not limited. He is in you. He is on you. He can touch you. Even those who aren't here today, Lord, I, I specifically just reach out to Dave and Celine. You are on them. You are in them. Touch them in the name of Jesus. Lord, I, I pray, God, um, for Don. Man, he has fought a battle over two different kinds of cancer over the last four years, and he needs some weight. He just needs to put on some weight, some strength. God, you are in every cell, so in the name of Jesus, we speak life to that bone marrow. We speak life to those bones. Lord, we just speak life to that appetite because you're there. We release life in Jesus' name. Now, God, I just pray that everyone here, everyone watching, will just begin to walk in their identity as a temple of God. And any resistance, any fight, any sickness, anything they feel, Lord, they just reach out to the God that is upon them and in them, you, by your spirit. And they declare liberty, they declare health, they declare freedom in the name of Jesus. And your church becomes empowered once again to reach the nations in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you.